Good afternoon. Someone once said, we all love the preacher with heaven on his lips and never a word about the other place. Well, the other place takes center stage in today's gospel story in what I think Jesus presents to us as a cautionary tale. We're very familiar with it. But I think it has some very interesting and subtle points that are worth our reflection. There was a rich man, and there was a poor man. Now, one would expect that the rich man, because of the status that his wealth gave him, would be pretty well known in his community. And yet, he is the one in the story without a name. The poor man is given a name, Lazarus. The rich man is nameless. He has no legacy whatsoever. So an interesting point. And then when he bargains with Abraham about, you know, uh, first of all, asking him to have Lazarus, you know, kind of be his water boy, right? bring some water to cool his tongue, Abraham says, you know, there's a chasm here. In other words, the eternity that we carve out for ourselves is made from the choices that we make in this life. And then, of course, he says, well, he knows the gig is up for himself, but he still has family. He's got brothers. He says, well, then send Lazarus. Send Lazarus to them. And again, Abraham comes back. They have Moses. They have the prophets. And in a way, what he's saying is, so did you. During your lifetime, you had Moses and you had the prophets. Were you so unaware and so unconnected and so just out of it that you never listened to them? Moses, who gave us the commandments, and the prophets, all of them, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Amos, whom we hear from today, all of them who throughout history came to remind the Israelites what Moses had commanded, what God had commanded through Moses, what Moses had given in the law to care for others around you, especially those most in need. So, in a way, Abraham is saying, you weren't paying attention. Your brothers have the same thing you did. And then that whole thing about, but if someone were to rise from the dead, and of course that's what we have. We have someone who did come and live and die and rise from the dead to cement this teaching that God has given us, probably never expressed more completely and powerfully than in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, the only time when Jesus speaks at length about the final judgment. And he talks about that separation that will occur between sheep and goats. And it's so familiar to us, whatsoever you do to the least, You do to me. God himself takes personally how we care for one another. Faith is empty unless it expresses itself in our care and love and support for one another. So the cautionary tale is very clear to us. It's it's about caring for the one right in front of us. And perhaps that is what is most intriguing about this story. Because there's no way that the rich man didn't see Lazarus. He was right at his door, right at his gate, every day. He was right there. And somehow, because of his complacency, because of his uninvolvedness, his apathy, his indifference, he didn't care for him. And so let us be clear, this rich man is in Hades, not because he's rich, but because of his complacency because of his inability to act in care of his brother, who was in need. So I think the action that kind of leads all of us to, in this coming week certainly, but in in our faith life in general, is to not miss what's right in front of us. Who is that person at our door, at our gate, right in front of us, that we see every day who is in any kind of need and needs our care? And again, don't think of poverty 
just in terms of material wealth, because there's all kinds of poverty. There's the poverty of loneliness for those who are homebound or in care facilities. There's the poverty of, of um, spiritual poverty for those who are, are searching for the living God. There's the poverty of illness of those who are struggling with any kind of sickness in mind or body or spirit. Who are those people right in front of us, right at our door, that we can carry the love of Christ to and touch them in some concrete and meaningful way? So so there's an action for us to consider this week from this cautionary tale. Secondly, I would ask you um, to uh, pray in a specific way this week. In the announcements, it was mentioned that Bishop Brennan is gathering all of the priests of the diocese this coming week for a convocation. And because of that, there will be no morning mass here on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday this coming week. And in place, Deacon Michael will be here at 8.30 those, on those mornings to lead uh, morning prayer from the Liturgy of the Hours. So this uh, convocation is an opportunity, I think, for us certainly to share Um, uh, uh, a time fraternally together and to pray together but more importantly it's a time I think I think Bishop Brennan has for us to kind of launch a planning process and as I have studied the materials that are uh, you know going to be we're going to be using at this convocation we have some serious planning to do so for instance 33 years ago when I was ordained we had 130 active priests in the Diocese of Columbus, the Diocese of Columbus being 23 counties in Ohio, 106 parishes in those 23 counties. So we had 130. We certainly had enough priests to deploy, not only to the parishes, but we had priests working full-time in hospital ministries, full-time in prison ministry, full-time in high schools, full-time on college campuses. Today, we have 86 active priests in our diocese still caring for 106 parishes, all the hospital ministry, the prison ministry, high schools, college campuses, all of that. And it's projected that in 15 years that number will be down to 70 or below. So how do we prepare for that? Well, certainly part of the preparation is to try to encourage and pray for vocations, right, to ordain more priests. But here's another interesting statistic. For every 10 men who enter the seminary, four of them will be ordained. And of those four, three will minister through to retirement. So in order for us as a diocese to just maintain the 86 active priests that we have right now into the future, to just maintain that minimal number, we would have to have 80 men in the seminary right now. We have 25. So looking at all of these projections and all of these numbers, it's important to prepare and to plan. You know, do we have more consortiums of parishes, a consortium being a cluster of two or three or even more parishes that one priest takes care of? Do we close parishes? Um, So we have to kind of be able to look ahead and and do some of this planning. So I ask for your prayers for this project. As I said, the convocation is just the beginning of launching this uh, planning process for our diocese. The statistics that I've been reading in in preparation also showed me that this parish, I didn't realize this, is tied for number four in terms of the largest parishes in the diocese. We are, the, we are tied with another parish as the fourth largest parish in the diocese. So I think you can rest assured there will always be a priest here, at least one. <laughs> so pray for us and pray for an increase in vocations to the priesthood. And then finally, pray especially for Father Jim. I have to tell you, he um, had an accident on his bicycle uh, the other day and um, messed up his shoulder, so... He goes in tomorrow for an MRI, and, but his doctor is pretty sure he's torn something, so he'll probably have to have surgery. So he'll miss the conference, but um, keep him in, in your prayers as well.